Before we begin, I want to remind you that uh, the third Sunday in Advent, which will be December 13th, is when Archbishop Haviland will be here. I want to remind you also, if you do come to our services uh, at our church, if you do come to the services at this, your church, uh, we'll be very happy to see you. But we do ask you observe the proper precautions for coronavirus, and and uh, that includes the masking, that includes the social distancing, and includes not shaking hands until this is over. Um, for the rest of, of you, of course, we we we're doing the best we can with these to make these videos as useful as possible uh, at home. Uh, I uh, want to tell you that it's going to be the 23rd Sunday after Trinity. I also have been reminded that I must remind you, please keep your pledges current. Please sign the pledge letter for next year. You know, we're not closing our doors. We're not going away. This is all going to end. Pfizer's on the brink of giving us a vaccine. A vaccine this is going to end, and God's going to to bring it to an end in his time. And it is my hope we will have all learned the lessons that he has used this to teach us. Okay, here we go. 23rd Sunday after Trinity. Prophets. 
Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high. And on earth peace, goodwill good towards men. men. We, we praise thee, thee, we bless thee, 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 we worship thee, we glorify thee, thee. we give we thanks to thee for thy great glory. glory. O Lord God, God heavenly King, King, God the Father Almighty, <coughs> O Lord the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For thou only art holy, thou only art the Lord. Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art but a sign in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. O God, our refuge and strength, who art the author of all godliness. <coughs> Be ready to beseech thee to hear the devout prayers of thy church and grant that those things which we ask faithfully we may obtain effectually through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The epistle is written in the third chapter of Blessed Paul the Apostle's epistle to the Philippians, beginning with the 17th verse. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us as an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of, cross of Christ which end in destruction, which end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed unto the body of his glory, according to the working whereby he is able even to subject all things unto himself. Here in the epistle. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> it is thou, O Lord, that savest us from our enemies, and puttest them to confusion that hate us. We make our boast in God all day long, and will praise thy name forever. Called unto thee, O Lord. 
be with you. And with thy spirit. The Holy Gospel is written in the 22nd the chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew, beginning with the 15th verse. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teach us the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of man. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, Whose? is this image and superscription. They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. Praise be to thee, O Christ. <clears throat> I believe in one God, the Father Lord Almighty, maker, maker of, of heaven, heaven and earth. earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us sin and for our salvation came, came down from, from heaven, and was guarded by the Holy Ghost to the Virgin Mary, and, and was made man, man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory, to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is made by the prophets. And I believe in one Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. The line that combines today's epistle, epistle and gospel readings is when St. Paul having spoken about those who mind the earthly things, says, for our citizenship is in heaven. And that's why we look 
for the coming of Christ to raise us from the dead and share that immortality he obtained on Easter after he died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead, rose from not just being dead, mean, but meaning he rose from the whole state of being mortal. He's no longer subject to death. And by that power, it says this, in his, the, his body of glory risen from the dead, the man who cannot die, according to the working whereby he is able even to subject all things unto himself. I want to read how my brother David Bentley Har translated that. We'll transfigure the body of our abjectness, conform to the body of his glory by the operation of his power, for setting all things in order under himself. That's our ultimate fate. Is if we're believers, it's good, it's happy, it's to have all things set in order under himself, meaning we'll, death will be no more. But he sets all things in order under himself, and that's how we should be living even in this world, because that's our only hope. That's who we are, our citizens. He does say our citizenship will be in heaven. He says it is in heaven. That's the present tense. So we look at the setting of all things in order under Christ because of his power. Hey, you remember when you were a child and you had buttoned your shirt for the first time and you were suddenly noticed you had an extra hole up here and an extra button down here. And sometimes, even as an adult, when you've been in a hurry and you've rushed, you've realized, oh no, I've done it. And you have, you have to unbutton every single button and do it all over. Because why, when you get one button out of order, they're all out of order. Isn't that right? One button's out of Vince Lombardi, the coach that was so famous in football, was doing motivational films for corporations that wanted him to do these films so they could train their sales people. And uh, he said to the, in these films, the same thing that he said to his football players, that your order of priorities in life must be this. Your job comes first, your family comes second, and your God comes third. Well, there's two problems with that. First of all, you must not treat God as if he can come in third. But secondly, whatever comes in first is your God. You know, your job can't be your God. It just can't. No, I mean, if, 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 if the... Things of which your life are comprised are those three things, job, family, God. Uh, God has to come first. Your family would have to come after God and your job would have to come after your commitment to your family because providing for your family has to be a main reason even for having a job. In fact, if, if a job is really something you, you're doing correctly as a Christian, you're doing that to the glory of God, to, as if you're serving Christ and not men, which means a job that's nothing but, well, just making money for yourself. It's not really worthy of a Christian. If it isn't doing some kind of good, if it isn't meeting some kind of need, if it isn't a service, um, you might want to reconsider what you're doing. However, I'm going to say this. You see, God comes first, and and and... That's why what Jesus says in today's gospel needs to be heard in fullness. Don't just say render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and then start giving a speech about uh, citizenship and patriotism and so forth. None of which would have applied in this, by the way. Caesar in this context was a foreign emperor who had conquered them and, and the, the tax is a tribute paid to someone who defeated them and conquered them. But even so, St. Paul does speak of the magistrates who uphold laws as people for to whom we should pay taxes and that we should support them. Not because men's laws are always just and right, but because the order is in, in society is needed and it's for the purpose of 
the kind of laws the magistrate enforces, which are consistent with thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's in the 13th chapter of Romans, and Paul does take it to that. That's the purpose of it, because he's, he says, uh, you fulfill all the law, and it's just, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And so many of those earthly laws are very much like the Ten Commandments, because they're consistent with loving your neighbor. Okay, that's fine. In that sense, you know, there's something to rendering unto Caesar that, that is also just a part of being uh, uh, in what they call the social contract. I understand that. But if you stop there, you're missing the point. It's rendering to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. So if you're doing your civic duties, you're really doing it for God. You're not really doing it. You're not doing it for Caesar. You're not doing it for the United States government. You're not doing it for the government of North Carolina or Orange County or Chapel Hill, these places where I am at the moment and where I live. I'm really, you know, when I look at the speed limit, it's hard for me to, to uh, you know, to be really perfectly consistent with this because I mean, you know, but sometimes I find out, oops, I'm speeding. The fact is, Obey the speed limit, obey the traffic laws. If there's laws of, that you're in certain places right now during the pandemic, you're supposed to wear a mask, wear it! Because the whole point of these kind of laws is thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. They're perfectly consistent with loving God. But if, but that's, the only reason to render anything unto Caesar is because you're rendering to God the things that are God's. That's the only reason you're doing it. What belongs to God? Do you, you're not allowed to render unto Caesar the things that are God's. Look at the history of tyranny. What have men done in history that has caused such terrible injustice, that has brought dictators to power, that has allowed people to trample the rights of others, to make unjust wars, to make the world a place devoid of peace. It's they've rendered to Caesar the things that are God's. See, Jesus did come up as someone who stood in trial in Caesar's court through Pontius Pilate, the governor and who was condemned to death and was treated as an enemy of the state. Why? Well, he wasn't a rabble rouser. He wasn't preaching sedition and rebellion. He wasn't uh, someone dangerous. He wasn't going to start a worldly revolution. These are earthly things that we're not to mind, uh, to, 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 be obsessed with, you know, to set focus all of our effort and attention on. He wasn't going to do those things. And yet he was considered a threat to the established order because he rendered unto God the things that are God's in an unjust world. When a saint of God becomes a martyr, and is treated as an enemy and is persecuted. It's not for something trivial. There's no room in God's kingdom for the rebel without a cause. You may have to die on a hill, but it better be a hill worth dying on. I don't want to hear any of your libertarian nonsense about why there shouldn't be a speed limit. I don't want to hear any nonsense about why you shouldn't have to wear a mask when you go in a store, even though the law says in your state that you're to wear a mask because of the coronavirus and the fact that the 
droplets that come out of you, your mouth, and are carried along. Mike, can, you know, can, you can argue about it all you want. I I believe that the scientists have it right, and that we we're being told some good common sense stuff. The point is, even if you don't believe it, I got news for you. That's not a hill that you're allowed to put to die on. You owe God your life. You're going to die on a hill. It has to be for the sake of Jesus and his kingdom. To render unto God the things that are God's means you don't die for some trivial, stupid thing. You're not going to go out there as a rebel without a cause. You may very well be persecuted someday for following Christ, as many of our brothers and sisters throughout the world right now are persecuted in other countries for following Christ. It's not going to be because you're a rebel without a cause. It's going to be not even because you're a rebel at all. You're not going to be a rebel. You're going to be the one who is actually living a life properly set in order under the true authority, Jesus. But by doing right, you may come into conflict with Caesar. You must render unto God the things that are God's. That's the first button in the first hole. That's what keeps it in order. Concentrating on worldly things is what these other preachers do. St. Paul warned the Corinthians that they might be listening to false apostles. and They had been subjected to hearing from false apostles and deceitful workers transforming themselves into servants of Christ, into the apostles of Christ, but who are not. And they preach, he says, another Jesus, another gospel. And they have another spirit that you have not received. And here he says, and as we've heard it today, many walk. He says, follow our example as we're following Christ. Is basically what he's saying. You know, I'm an example. You do what you've seen in me and the men with me, Timothy, Titus, Luke, etc., for many walk of whom I've told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame of mind, earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven. Now, it's fascinating. It doesn't say they're enemies of Christ. See, there is that other Jesus he warned the Corinthians of. Doesn't tell you to take up your cross. Doesn't tell you to repent of your sins in order to follow him. To put your lusts to death. Your resentments to death. Your, to kill your inclinations that are sinful in order to follow him. That's not the Jesus that they like. They like the, some, some kind of Jesus they've made up in their own minds. And instead of following what Jesus teaches, they say, what did Jesus do? Well, that's a stupid question. The question isn't what would Jesus do, it's what did Jesus do and what did he command you and me? And you don't have to guess about it because there it is. It's plain as day. If you really know his commands, you know what to do. Fact of the matter is, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. There's a deep meaning in that. You know, they don't mind naming the name of Jesus. They don't mind preaching. They don't mind courting worldly power, getting into Caesar's good graces, perhaps, by preaching a false gospel getting people to send, who can't afford it to send them money to buy their private jets because they claim they need them as servants of this Jesus of theirs who has no cross. This Jesus who had, uh, doesn't make any demands on them. Even though the real Christ even 
didn't even have his own donkey and had to borrow one to enter Jerusalem on its back. <sighs> Enemies of the cross of Christ will gladly preach from today's gospel, but they'll cut it short. They'll say, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. They won't say it unto God the things that are God's. They will perhaps even be willing to preach to you that you should render unto Caesar the things that are God's. Tyrants in history have wanted your conscience. They don't want you to serve any other God but themselves. Tyrants in history have commanded you to do evil things. They've commanded their people to do evil things. Things contrary to love of God and love of neighbor. And to render those things that belong to God to Caesar is a terrible sin. So this is all setting things in order properly, letting Christ by his power in your life set all things in order under himself. Now unto God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost be ascribed as is most justly do all might, majesty, dominion, power, and glory, henceforth world without end. Amen.